I'm Steph White. I'm from Michigan. And uh, as um, was noted, my my title is cross enrollment coordinator. I've had this position for about three years now. The state of Michigan launched a cross enrollment program uh, three years ago. We have a grant from a foundation. So uh, it's kind of a trial period to see if um, if the state uh, finds it useful and we'll add it on um, as a full time position. If so, um, in the future, go ahead. Next slide. So today I'll walk you through and tell you a little bit about how I have um, decided to kind of organize our work around cross enrollment, how we've defined it here in Michigan. You know, it's very much new um, kind of program area. I uh, drew on some existing resources, but a lot of this has just been kind of like uh, do some work and then try to define what it is I just did. Um, so I'll tell you how we define cross enrollment. We call it basically the practice of enrolling people in all the programs for which they qualify. As you all know, a lot of people enroll in Medicaid and also qualified for child care subsidies and food assistance, but uh, a lot of times they're only uh, enrolled in one program. So we're looking for ways to meet everyone's, uh, get people enrolled in everything. Um, we see it not as a what, but more of a way, a way of approaching our work, similar to human-centered design. Are we using a cross-enrollment lens and a practice? Are we in inculcating the practices of cross-enrollment in our work? And so we break it down into a set of tools, practices, and operating principles to achieve our goals. Next slide. These are the principles after, uh, after working for about a year, I would say, I kind of um, realized that the key principles we're relying on in order to call something cross enrollment and that we're trying to put into practice are these um, seven here. And um, I won't read them each off to you, you can see them. But what I'll do is I'll kind of illustrate how these are used using the case study of a WIC cross enrollment um, project that we did was led by our friends at Benefits Data Trust, BDT, uh, and Jess Manili, who's at APHSA now. When she was at BDT, she taught me a lot of this stuff. So uh, those are good resources uh, to draw from if you're interested. Next slide. So with our WIC case study, I'll kind of walk through this general slide and then I'll dig more into some details. So the first step in cross enrollment is to find compatible programs. And obviously SNAP and WIC are both compatible. They serve um, low income families uh, who are in need of food subsidies to boost it, um, to boost nutrition and, and food, especially families with children. Um, when we look at adjunctive eligibility, WIC is a great, you know, program to work on since both Medicaid and SNAP make you adjunctively eligible for WIC. Um, I should point out at this point, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities put together a uh, manual back in 2017 that kind of links to a lot of these programs. Um, and I sent Sophia a link to that. Um, and that was one of the beginning uh, resources that I drew on to figure out how, what program should we be trying to link together. And then, you know, one of the basic and uh, probably biggest portions of the work that we do around cross enrollment is uh, using available uh, data and uh, matching the data that we that we find. I'll go into a little bit more detail on those two areas in a second, but in general, you know, we look for enrollment data. Do we have who, who's enrolled in Medicaid or SNAP? Then we find out, do we have the contact information? Then we find out, can we share that information? Can that information be shared with us so that then we can reach out to the available people? Um, we had to do a couple of data share agreements and uh, those took a fair amount of time. Um, and then once you found the source and can share it, you know, you have to do the data matching and that includes our tech folks are um, in Michigan, it's called the Department of Technology Management and Budget. And um, those are the folks who know how to design and run queries out of these massive databases. And that takes a lot of time. Um, and again, I will say, well, one of the lessons that I learned from another resource recently um, 
we have folks here from the uh, Code for America. So Jennifer Polka, as many of you know, has written this book, Recoding America, which is excellent. Um, and I strongly recommend everyone on this call read it uh, and take it to heart. But one of the lessons learned from that is to bring the data people, the technology folks in early in any kind of program work that you're doing like this, because that question of how do we design and run the query to get the information we need from the data warehouse was more complicated than I anticipated, you know, at the beginning. Um, and then once you've done that, do you have the pathways in order to move the data from Medicaid, from WIC, from SNAP to the outreach channels? Each of those steps along the way took um, some, some work. It's not just an automatic process. It takes some time to work out. Next slide. And uh, if in any kind of um, cross enrollment, we try to work on proactive outreach. You know, there are a lot of states who operate in the idea that if people really need the help, they'll find their way to us. Um, but cross enrollment in the way that we're operating in Michigan is that we are working to proactively reach out to eligible Michiganders and get them enrolled. And this is where the BDT came, campaign came in uh, to reach out to potential WIC clients. So they helped us set up and run a text messaging campaign, which I'll give you some more details on that. And importantly, we really try to encourage people to apply. So some people, you know, they know things are there, but they need a little nudge. And so we want to be able to nudge people. Um, and these are not, you know, actions. It may sound obvious to us, but, you know, these are not habits and practices that have been natural or normal or um, just kind of, yeah, everyday practices for the people uh, in Michigan in the past. So, you know, this was a growth uh, process. Um, when we're doing these enrollment um, endeavors and these campaigns, we really try to har uh, hard to uh, reduce the barriers on our clients and reduce the administrative burden. Uh, another book that I read that was fantastic was at Administrative Burdens by Pamela Hurd and, and uh, Don Moynihan. Um, also gave me a great orientation to how to like kind of uh, organize my thoughts and approach this work. Um, and in this case with our WIC study, when the text message went out, we allowed clients to just reply one straight on their phone in order to get in the queue for an appointment. Once they reply, just hit the one on their phone, then they were, um, in line for a WIC office to call them and follow up. They didn't have to seek out, okay, where's the WIC office? What's the number? How do I make an appointment? You know, how do I get a hold of somebody? The WIC office will call them. And then lastly, with cross enrollment, we work on leveraging our relationships. And um, we not we didn't do it so much with this WIC case, but most of the text messages we send out start with, hi, basically this is MDHHS, an agency you know. Next slide, please. So a little more details on the data. Um, the, as I said, um, the data share agreement, we needed two of them. Next slide, please. One was an external data share agreement that we uh, allowed us to share the data with our nonprofit partners, BDT, um, outside the state, but even within the state between WIC agency and um, in my department, the Economic Security Administration, we needed to have an in intra-agency agreement um, so that we could share that WIC information. And then I will say, um, you know, even beyond this intra-agency, there was an, a real interest in having uh, the WIC data controlled and protected and the privacy protected. So we ended up setting up a process whereby um, the data tech um, you know, the analyst um, collected the information, did the data matching, and then gave us the list of folks who were not on WIC. Then we never actually were sharing the WIC, uh, the currently enrolled WIC clients. That information wasn't shared with us. Um, next slide, please. Let me say one more thing about the data share agreements is it's not just, I think, at, when you're starting this out, uh, what I discovered was that it isn't just sharing, uh, working out how the data is moved, 
but really building trust and relationships between the agencies. If we are not used to working uh, across our silos and with other agencies, and we have ingrained and you know inculcated this belief and understanding that we need to protect the data and the privacy of our clients, even within the wider you know Department of Health, then that's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to say, okay, now I'm just going to share it all with you. So another reason to just really take your time and plan that um, to spend the time building relationships and building up trust uh, between all the partners when you're doing that data share agreement. Uh, and then for the data match, obviously we had to then create you know these lists of people enrolled in Medicaid or and or enrolled in SNAP and somebody's pregnant in the house and there are children under the age of five in the house and they're not on WIC and they're in our target county and we have their mobile phone number. And for I'm sure plenty of people on this call know better than me probably, um, you, didn't, you can't just like say, you know, okay, here's the information that I want. I'll spit it out of the the data warehouse tomorrow, and then you can start calling on the second day. This took time. It took time to uh, run, design the query, run the query, check the query, re, uh, you know, then make some changes. And then it also, um, next slide, please. It also took us a lot of time to create these data pathways to set up the um, SFTP between us and um, BDT, um, again, to open the portals, send something through the portal, check the file, did it come through correctly? Did it upload into on their side correctly? You know, all of these things took a while. And uh, as you're starting any of these projects, I just encourage you to anticipate that it's going to take perhaps longer than you think. It's like remodeling, you know, add 30% time to anything they tell you. All right, next slide, please. So here's how the campaign went. Uh, we finally identified 28,000 households who are on Medicaid or SNAP, but not on WIC in seven out of our counties. Then BDT divided them up between an intervention group and a control group so we could test the efficacy of the um, sending the text messages and make sure it wasn't just, you know, random chance that people were signing up for WIC after we sent them a text message. Um, you'll see here that in our list, 95% of all clients had a cell phone. This was a couple of years ago. I think the latest stats I've seen is at 97% of everybody um, ha in America has a cell phone. So this is the best, you know, most reliable way to reach folks. Next slide, please. Here's a sample of the text message they got. And again, um, you know, they could reply stop if they wanted to get out or they could reply one to get started. Um, please note also in this sample message, reply four for Spanish or Arabic. That was a, a new thing we tried to let people know straight from the beginning if you want to um, you know, we'll, we'll take care of, again, this is like removing the burden from them. We'll take care of the translation for you. Just reply four and we can get you to the Spanish or the Arabic. Those are the two uh, biggest languages spoken, Michigan outside of English. Um, so those are the ones we, we put. And then obviously, you know, we got them sent to the WIC office if they replied that yes, they wanted to know more. Next, um, here's the key findings. It was successful. 91% increase in WIC certifications attributed to the texting. That is a huge increase. This was a small sample size, small pool, uh, but it was huge and very clear that the texting had a, an impact. Um, what's really interesting is the second bullet, um, well, actually the third bullet down, cert the certification rate of those who finally did get um, signed up for WIC was higher for people who did not respond to the text messages than for those who did. Really interesting. Next slide, please. Again, here's the numbers, um, a little bit more detail on the raw numbers. Uh, BDT um, analyzed um, where, what other program the client um, had, and then what the result was. We found that people on Medicaid only had a big um, difference in or response to the texting. People on more than one program and people on SNAP only had a smaller response to the text messages, but overall 91% increase. Next slide. And then this is just, I find this really interesting to see the um, graphic uh, representation of 
of the folks who were on Medicaid. We sent them a text message. They didn't respond. Those were that was the biggest group that went went on their own, got enrolled in WIC. Um, much bigger than the folks who did respond to the text messages, and obviously much bigger than the control group. Next slide, please. So here's the tools that I think you need in order to do cross enrollment. Number one is leadership. I can't emphasize that enough. You know, it feels like for lots of pro of these program managers that I work with, it feels like a little icing on the cake, right? The cake is, are you running a WIC program that enrolls Michiganders in WIC? Yes, they are. So would you like to do a little extra? Well, maybe, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. And as we go through and reach these difficulties, um, having leadership say, I want this to happen, uh, really helped us struggle through um, and get over those hurdles and get to the finish line. Um, without that, it's going to be really hard to do. Data share agreements, again, you know, plan to spend a lot of time. BDT has a guide to data sharing, uh, which is very helpful, can walk you through it. And remember to think about it not only as um, data agreements, but really relationship building tools. How can you get used to working with this uh, program that you maybe previously had been, you know, in your own separate silos? Uh, the data matching pathways could be their own project on their own. How do we get the data from one place to the next place? Who handles it? Um, how do we send it securely to an offsite location? And again, I'll reemphasize, have the data and tech experts in your conversations from the beginning. It'll make it so much easier. Everything that we do now in, um, you know, support program sharing is highly highly dependent upon um, data and technology. So having those folks, you know, uh, integrated into your team from the get-go and not just expect to like hand them a project and say, here, execute. It doesn't work that way. Have them integrated, it'll go much better. And then obviously there are other proactive tools besides text messaging, um, mailings, phone calls, traditional media, social media are all tools for reaching out to folks. Um, yeah. I think that's it. Next slide. 